Well, this month here at First Unitarian, we've been exploring the theme of transcendence. Now, many of you have heard of transcendentalism, which is both a religious and a secular literary movement that arose in the early 1800s. And to be clear, that's not what today's sermon is about, although it's not completely unrelated. Uh, to transcend means to go beyond, and transcendentalism as a movement was about ways of knowing that go beyond the strict boundaries of logic and rationality, instead emphasizing emotion and intuition as sources of creativity and knowledge. Henry David Thoreau, along with his friend and mentor, Unitarian minister Ralph Waldo Emerson, are perhaps the most famous of the transcendentalists, but the movement was undeniably influenced by the contributions of Margaret Fuller, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, and Julia Ward Howe, of which the last two were also Unitarians. So the history of our faith tradition is closely intertwined with this movement, but again, this sermon is not about transcendentalism, the movement. It's about transcendence, which is a much broader concept. So as we explore the theme of transcendence today, I'd like to narrow it down a bit by approaching it through a spiritual lens. As a spiritual concept, I wanna take the idea of transcendence, of going beyond, and apply it in the context of our spiritual lives and going beyond the boundaries that hold us back from a spiritually fulfilling life. A full disclosure, this is not an intuitive aspect of myself, the spiritual part of me. To reference the Enneagram, which is a personality typing system that helps people understand the underlying motivations that drive our actions and our decision making. The Enneagram recognizes nine personality types which are divided into three groupings, the heart center type, the head center types, and the gut center types. And these groupings refer to what influences you the most when you make a decision, the head, the heart, or the gut. And of the nine personality types, I am a type six, often called the loyalist or the loyal skeptic, and my type is smack in the middle of the head center. Which means that when it comes to making decisions, I rely heavily on my head and my thoughts. Now, when I'm talking here about our spiritual lives, I'm talking about two things, the going inward and the reaching outward. Growth and transformation in our spiritual lives is about both plumbing the depths of our inner selves and connecting with something greater than ourselves. And this could be a challenging process, especially for us head types. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm fine with spiritual growth, the concept of it. I just want a clear plan with step-by-step -step instructions <laughs> and guaranteed outcomes. One barrier to spiritual growth that I've faced is a difficulty in sticking to spiritual practices. Spiritual practices would be a whole lot easier for me to do consistently if I knew exactly what I was supposed to gain by doing them. I want achievable goals and tangible results. But unfortunately, that's just not quite how spiritual practices work. Most spiritual practices are aimed at quieting the mind and getting our hearts to be open and receptive to what is going on around us and within us, which is typically easier for you heart and gut-centered types. But all of the Enneagram types have a particular challenge in common, and that is the challenge of being human. We humans are meaning-making beings. We look for patterns and explanations to give significance to our experiences. We are concerned not just with what happens, but also with why. And so what am I to make of this? And while we humans all share this quality of being meaning makers, we do not all have a shared meaning that we all understand as the purpose of our human lives. We are meaning making beings, and yet that meaning is not prescribed. That is to say, meaning is inherent, but the meaning is not. And so it is up to each 
one of us to determine our own purpose in life and how we are to derive meaning from it. And as we live into our fourth principle by engaging in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, we often begin with an attempt to understand our own selves better. And many people, I would argue, include, uh, including, uh, well, they include in the meaning that they create for themselves some explanation and some understanding of who they are and how they fit into this world. And I would even take it a step further by suggesting that for many people, myself included, that this means including a desire for continued growth and self-improvement as our understanding of how we fit into the world evolves. But this self-improvement work is not easy. Part of understanding who we are means understanding what we are capable of. And just as we create for ourselves a sense of what is meaningful, we also create for ourselves a sense of what we can and cannot do. At some point, we were unable to do some task or another. And once we give meaning and value to this aspect of ourselves, once we name that inability as part of our being, it can be difficult to transcend the self-imposed boundaries of what we know or think we know about ourselves. At this point, we cease to be someone who didn't do something and we become someone who cannot do that thing. Well, I've been working with the Enneagram because I want to learn to recognize the tendencies that I have that lead me to seeing myself in this way. For my type, type sixes, we struggle with fear and trusting ourselves and trusting the world. We believe that everything is about to fall apart, that we are all just one bad decision away from the catastrophic destruction of everything we hold dear. Any other sixes out there? And as much as we don't trust that good things will happen in the world, we don't trust ourselves to be able to respond appropriately in the face of a world and people who are destined to self-destruct. So we sixes spend all of our time and energy believing that we have to hold everything together or it will inevitably fall apart. Every waking moment is spent in a mode of constant vigilance. We are always scanning our environment for risks and threats, for what could go wrong. Only we see what could go wrong and assume that it is almost certainly going to go wrong. When I came to understand this about myself, that this is how I was thinking about the world, I could recognize the internalization that was happening. I understood that by viewing myself as perpetually on the brink of failing at every moment or at constant risk of things falling apart, that it, had then, that it was then easy uh, to let that kind of thinking go one step further. It was easy to go from, I might fail, to I'm a failure, to internalizing that constant doubt and mistrust and making it not just an outward circumstance that needs to be faced, but part of my identity itself. Now this kind of internalization certainly makes self-improvement very difficult. But in that reading that we heard earlier from Alan Watts, uh, Alan Watts makes it clear, he, or he makes a case, that it's not just difficult, but it's impossible, that we are actually incapable of improving ourselves. The flaws that we see in ourselves that make us in need of improvement are exactly what, uh, the things that are preventing us from making those improvements. We are flawed, and so we cannot fix ourselves. I can't say that I agree wholeheartedly with Alan Watts' conclusion. I don't think we're incapable of improving ourselves or the world what I do agree with, though, is that his conclusion is the first step. We need to begin the process of improvement by being curious, by learning what is happen to watch what is happening without the need to control it. Because one thing I'm learning is that there is precious little we can actually control. So we start 
by observing what is happening and by observing our own reaction to it. So that's right. If we learn to step outside of ourselves and become an observing higher self, as Watts puts it, then often without even trying to change our response, our acting self, and that is the one that is being observed by the higher self, will often make the adjustment without any effort. Do you ever act differently when you know that you're being watched? Do you get a little self-conscious? And I'm not talking about when you are doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. I'm just talking about simple, ordinary, everyday things like picking out apples at the grocery store. If I'm shopping late at night and I'm the only one in the produce department, I can take my sweet apple picking time. I can check each apple for marks, for bruises, and I can even smell them if I want to without the risk of my selection practice being scrutinized. But if I'm at the store at, say, five or six o'clock in the evening, that's a different story entirely. The presence of other people observing me has me adjust how I select my apples. Now, I don't go into the store and consciously think, well, I'm being watched, I'd better use apple selection method number two. The grab it if it looks all right method. It's not a conscious adjustment that we make, but in the presence of an observer, I will often naturally adjust my actions and my reactions. And it may not be true of apple picking, but I'll bet that you do this too, at least with some things. In fact, this is called the observer effect, and studies back it up. A Scientific American article called How the Illusion of Being Observed Can Make You a Better Person <laughs> lays out a series of studies that have monitored people's behavior when they are made to feel like they're being watched through either the presence of other people in the room, a blinking camera in the corner, or one study even used a poster with eyes on it. And even that was shown to improve people's willingness to clean up after themselves in the area where the poster was displayed. Well, the same idea applies when we take a step back to notice ourselves in the moment. When we pause to be fully present and notice what's going on both around us and within us, we are engaging in a mindfulness practice, which is kind of like invoking the observer effect on ourselves. We live up to a better version of ourselves when we think we are being watched, and it works even when the observer is our own higher self. Now, there is something that I think that Alan Watts got right, and that is that if self-improvement is our goal, then we have the wrong goal. This time, when he speaks about self-improvement, it's not about the impossibility of it, but rather about our motivation for improvement. And really, it's about our motivation for anything. He says, there's only one reason for going to school, and that is that somebody has got something for you that you are incredibly interested in. How to write Chinese characters, or how to understand botany, and you would like to know. You are just interested in flowers, and you would like to find out everything there is to be known about them. That's the point of coming to school. Or you might like to know how to practice yoga. But the whole point of coming to school is that you're interested in something. You don't come to improve yourself. But the trouble is that the schools got the wrong idea. They gave people honors for learning. And the reward for studying French should be the ability to speak French and enjoy reading French, and have fun with French people. But when you get a degree for it, then the degree becomes the point. It seems that he is providing a rather straightforward answer to this one, this question of motivation. I think he's saying that we should learn what we learn because we want to know about it. And we should improve ourselves, not because improvement is the goal, but because we want to know more about ourselves and the world to which we belong. 
We shouldn't try to improve ourselves. It will happen naturally when we stop trying to improve ourselves and instead open our hearts and our minds and our spirits and allow ourselves to be molded and shaped by our experiences. It will happen when we pursue purpose and meaning making. And when we are living into that meaningful life in the fullest way possible. So in summary, here is how to improve yourself. Step one, notice, be curious, learn something simply because you want to know it. Step two, get a new goal. <laughs> Rather than improvement for improvement's sake, maybe the goal can be living a life full of the things that interest you. The goal can be a life full of meaning. Follow these two simple steps and you'll be on your way to getting out of your way. I invite you to rise in body or spirit.